when I was younger, yeah, I went through a, a Neymar phase, I guess, where I decided I was just going to try to do, you know, I was looking for nutmegs every single session and, you know, yeah, I had to grow out of that eventually. My guest today is one of the US men's national team's quiet maestros, a 24-year-old who's risen through the ranks of US soccer step by step taken a series of leaps of faith along his club journey, always hungry to challenge himself, to grow as a player and as a human being. And also add to those air miles in order to claim one of those coveted roster spots on our US men's national team at the 2022 World Cup. I love watching this gent play. His stony faced determination, fluid efficiency on the ball, the way he turns beyond opposing midfielders as if fire osmosis, a beast of ball progression who can act like a metronome keeping the US men's national team on 4-4 time. Luke is a gent who really likes to do his talking on the field, which is all the more reason I'm so happy to have him here with me today. It's a joy to welcome from Los Celeste, Celta Vigo, in Spain's La Liga and your US men's national team. It's Mr. Luca de la Torre. Hi, Raj. It's nice to be here. I'd say it's nice to talk to an English person again. It feels like it's been a while. You know? I actually, I miss it, to be honest. <laughs> oh, we will talk about that and more. But hola, Luca. I do need to ask you, how are the Spanish lessons going? Your verb work, your past tenses? Yeah, it's going well. You know, I took two years in school when I was a kid. So it comes back pretty quickly. Lessons three times a week, right? I mean, how much does learning Spanish feel essential to truly being part of the club? You know, when you're a player, you can get away with actually not learning the language and kind of stay in a bubble. But um, I think it's important and I enjoy it. So yeah, I'm going to learn Spanish. Let's go back to the beginning because your journey has been quite singular. You grew up in San Diego, California, that town suspended in perpetual summer. Your dad, from whom you inherited your eternal hairline, a professor of microbiology and immunology at Scripps, and your mum, a director of stem cell biology at a research institute. Luca, what role did football play in such a cerebral, scientifically inclined household? So my dad decided before I was born that I was going to be a professional player. So I don't think I really had a choice. So did mine though, Luca. So did mine. So did thousands of dads. Thousands of dads have looked at their sons and been like, professional footballer. For them, school was important, but I could always kind of tell with my dad, as long as I was playing well, I could get away with not, you know, uh, doing too much. So yeah, for me, like, yeah, football was always, was always more important. Can we talk about your dad's obsession? It's called Parenting America. Your dad, I believe, Spanish, right, from the Canary Islands. But what was going on in his mind? Because he really did become one of the great influences in building a soccer pathway early for you. I guess he kind of took a scientific approach to it, actually. You know, he said, if you lived in Brazil, you'd be playing football on the street every day for six hours. But you live in America and no one plays football on the street here. So instead... You're going to go to training three times a week. You're going to play two to three games on the weekends. And every other day that you're not playing with a team, we're going to train together. That's why I'm comfortable on the ball. It's because my whole childhood, I was, I mean, I must have been touching the ball like thousands of times a day. When I was a kid, I never watched any football. I just played. I would watch uh, YouTube videos online. Never, uh, never full games. Didn't start doing that until I, I moved to Europe. So I didn't have like, uh, I don't know, I guess like an idea of like the world outside of just what, where I was playing. Who were we watching on YouTube? Videos of which players, which teams? Neymar, Messi, yeah, and Yesta. I mean, so many like YouTube compilations. What were you searching for, Luca? I just loved dribbling. Like when I was younger, yeah, I went through a, a Neymar phase, I guess, where <laughs> I decided I was just going to try to do, you know, I was looking for nutmegs every single session and, you know, yeah, I had to grow out of that eventually. But yeah, I still love that that part of the game, you know. It's it makes it exciting. It was when you were barely touched by an opponent in San Diego and you flung yourself on the floor in agony that your dad put an arm around you and said, Luca, son, the Neymar phase. I think so, it's time to bring it to an end. <laughs> no, it's when I went to England and they started kicking me and I thought, yeah, I can't. <laughs> Can't keep doing this, yeah. <laughs> oh, England, that's our contribution to world football. We'll kick the Neymar out of you. Yes. 
in 2013, at the ripe young age of 15, you left your life in San Diego, trading the early morning football fields with mist rolling in off the Pacific Ocean and carne asada burritos at Roberto's to join Fulham Football's Club Academy. A wholly different world from the one you knew. You are the child of academics mm. deciding to embark essentially on a PhD in world football. How did those conversations go with your parents? It was a bit crazy, you know. I think it's a bit too young, to be honest, like 15 to go somewhere by yourself that's so far away. And it was definitely really hard for me. Like, I think it would have been in hindsight or if I had a kid that wanted to do something similar, better to wait or to go somewhere a little bit closer to home. Um, but in the end, you know, I did learn a lot from it and I became like a really independent person, which I think is good when you're a player. But it was definitely difficult. There's no... Uh, no denying that. Off the field, can you talk about the culture shock you had to navigate? Because English people speak the same language, but the mentality is so bloody different to the Californians. Yeah, very different. Yeah. I think, you know, I had to learn about banter because no one taught me anything when I was a kid. It was pretty rough the first, you know, few years in changing rooms, I have to say. But no, it was... Yeah, English people are, are different, um, but I really enjoyed living there. You know, I was there, I lived in London for seven years, so I kind of grew up there. It was a really long time when I was there. I, I, Luca, I grew up in those changing rooms in England. It is still the Middle Ages in many regards in some of those changing rooms. Can you, can you describe for an American audience, what are those changing rooms like? I think it's like... Uh, like a, a war zone almost sometimes like it depends on the team you're a part of you know just a lot of kind of taking the piss out of each other you know some guys when they're not playing they'll be more aggressive you know it's kind of yeah, if they see you as a threat they might try to get in your head it's quite normal you know when you have an american accent as well you kind of sound to them quite funny so every time you say something it's <laughs> everyone just laughs um but uh yeah, you get you get used to it. I probably picked up kind of half an English accent when I was there as well, to be honest. It's called Brad Friedling, I think, Brad Luke. Friedling. <laughs> yeah, <it's about laughs> it, yeah. Great credit to the lads. We defended really well today. You continued the grind at Fulham, but as the club ping between relegation and promotion, a revolving door and managers, wasn't a lot of opportunity. It wasn't a great pathway for young players to crack that first team. Your contract with Fulham is winding down. And even though you're in the middle of a pandemic, you chose to let it go, bet on yourself and moved to the Netherlands in the Eredivisie with Heracles Almilo. Can you talk about the style of play, the locker room tactical conversations you encountered and how you adapted? What did you learn that? Dutch football is everyone wants to play. It doesn't matter if it's the team on the bottom of the table or, or Ajax. They all try to play out from the back. They all try to play good football. But it wasn't such a high level that um, I was on the outside looking in. Um, like I was relied on pretty early to play a lot of minutes. The Eredivisie turned out to be a truly positive, nourishing environment for you. It's a league that loves technical players like few others. And in two seasons at Eracles, you became a central part of the team. Your star rose. People took notice, including Greg Berhalter, the gaffer who called you up for return to the U.S. men's national team set up in 2021 for the qualifying campaign. Initially, in a limited role, cameos here and there. First of all, how does it work once Triple G has got you in the pool, which Dave Sarakan placed you in? Is he in touch before the call-up or between your first caps and that return? Had it just been radio silence? I got a call from him um, just to say, yeah, I was getting called up to the roster. The first time I was on the prelim, I, it was definitely that. I was like looking, looking, looking. And then finally I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. And I was like, oh, like this is it. Yeah. Okay, good. You know, but then you pick it up and you think, oh, maybe he's saying, um, you know, you're doing really well. Keep going, keep working hard. But no, nah, thankfully it was, uh, you're getting called up. In this period, you did become a cult hero to many US fans. You know, the hero known as LDLT. So many American fans were advocating for you to get called up because of your performances in the Netherlands. Are you aware of that? Does that filter through? Yeah, I would see stuff after national team games. And, you know, that's a good feeling that other people feel the same way. 
and it, it means a lot too when it's you know not my uh not my agent or my parents right it's just random people watching and they think yeah this is a guy i like to watch play that's like the best feeling right when someone tells me i really love watching you play you know that means the most to me you talk about those cameos in world cup qualifying they were so encouraging efficient in possession hard working out of it always with that serious business demeanor which is your trademark and it earned your starts in important games against Honduras on that frigid night in St. Paul, against Panama in Orlando. Over a full 90 minutes, I feel that many American fans were finally introduced to you as a player. How did your mindset shift given the opportunity to actually grow into a game and affect it from the very beginning? So the cameos are always high pressure because you're like, okay, I have 10, 15 minutes here. I need to make three good actions or else I'm not getting called up again. Like that's just always the feeling I had in my head. I don't know if it was true. And yeah, so my chance was was Honduras. And I remember I had this feeling like Greg told me the day before, okay, you're starting. And I thought like, F like of course he starts me in the minus 30 degree game. Like, you know, <laughs> this, this is my chance. Okay, great. Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess I made it work at the end of the day, but that was, uh, that was rough. Yeah. Greg, Greg's like, who likes cold? Oh, the San Diego kid. <laughs> yeah, he'll be fine, yeah. <laughs> Send him out. There is an amazing video done by Watke, which declared you to be the ultimate teammate. And it shows you getting in between any Panamanian who wanted to take out Pulisic, <laughs> push getting the referee away, any of your teammates, you were just there. Is that something that you're conscious of or does it just happen naturally? I guess I've always been like pretty chill, you know, ever since I was a kid, I had kids on my team who wanted to get into fights or whatever, or like, you know, Christian's, you know, he likes to play kind of hot and like aggressive. So I just try to put myself there just in case, you know, because you never know these days with VAR, if someone puts a hand in someone's face and they go down and they grab their eye, like it can be a red card. So that's why I do it. And there's an amazing part of it, Luca, is that you do it all. As you say, you're surrounded by players who are kind of hot. Your face, no emotion at all. Yeah, um, that's just, yeah, I have, I have resting bitch face, I guess. You know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a problem. It's, a, it's like a superpower. Yeah, I do have emotions, though. You know, it's just, yeah, uh, this is my, yeah. <laughs> you are never a stranger to big decisions. And you made another big call this summer, departing Heracles to join Celta Vigo in the northwest coast of Spain. Beach life as per San Diego again, although there's no Robertos in Vigo. Tell us how this move came to fruition and your decision to depart Heracles. Obviously, with the way the season ended, uh, Heracles, we were relegated and I knew I, I had to leave at that point. Even if we stayed up, I felt like I'd learned everything I could from that level. And it was, yeah, it was time to challenge myself again. And in regards to how the move happened, I was in contact with my agent over the summer. We knew that there was interest from five or six places that I felt like were could be a, a good move in, in the right direction, like a higher level, something uh, that could be good for me. And Celta was actually my first choice on, on that list. It all worked out pretty quickly. I was able to get a few weeks of preseason here. So yeah, it was good. Why was that team in that town, the famed world's biggest fishing port, that temple of Alberino wine? Why was it your first choice? What were you looking for? The style of play, really good league, technical players. It's a step up, but not such a big step up that I don't, you know, I feel like I won't get minutes, but still a big enough step up that I'm, I'm taking my game to the next level. You made your debut August 20th, second match of the season against Real Madrid, coming on in the 87th minute against the European champions. Did you experience nerves in that moment? Yeah, I was just desperate to get into the match. Actually, I mean, they made the change at 81 and Madrid had decided to keep the ball for seven minutes. And so that's why I, I didn't get on until, yeah, like three minutes left in the game. Um, but yeah, I was, it was another like really proud moment um, to make my debut. Also to play against Real Madrid was was really special. Um, so of course in the moment, yeah, I'm really focused and I, I just want to do my job, but after it's, it's a good feeling. When you shut your eyes and you do think about the ultimate goal, 
on this journey, Luca, this incredible journey, the ultimate destination, what do you see? I want to be a really important player for the national team. And I want to be a really important player for my club. Um, you know, and right now that's Celta Vigo. You know, that's something that um, I really want to do here. Um, I want to play a lot of games here. I think it's a, it's a great club in a beautiful city. And I could see myself staying here for a long time. And, and as a starter in the US team? I think I can be an important player for that team. You know, uh, right now I'm, I'm close already. I feel like I'm an important part of the squad. And I think I can be a starting player too. Oh, God speed, Luca. I gotta say, I cannot wait to see where this season takes you, both in your Celta Vega baby blue and in the colours of the US men's national team. Really, I revere your groundedness and your ambition in equal measure. It's incredible to speak to you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Subscribe here for more Men in Blazers videos and courage. Yo, yo, yo.